respond in healthier ways to the stresses of life, will improve the quality of their lives, will improve their health in general, will positively impact the course of their diseases, certainly including cancer, and will improve the quality of death. I'm still nine minutes ahead of schedule, so I'm getting happier as I go. Uh, slower? Good. Well, I'll use up a little bit more time. What I would like to do is to highlight what I consider to be the significant research in the area on the emotions and cancer. And these are four categories. The, the research that addresses the cancer-prone personality, is that slow enough? Good. I need all the help I can get. Uh, number two, coping strategies associated with length of survival with cancer. Counseling used in the prevention of cancer. And finally, counseling associated with increased survival times with cancer. The first is the oldest. We looked at the research on the cancer-prone personality. LeSean is the accepted historian. He did two major reviews of the world's literature in 1956 in the British Medical Journal and in 1959 in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute. Art Schmalley did the first prospective study looking at personality factors as predictors in the development of cancer of the cervix, and this was reported in Journal of Psychosomatic Medicine, 1966. Again, this is not new stuff. C.B. Thomas and Johns Hopkins did the first major prospective studies looking at senior medical students at Hopkins and reported her findings in 1974 with the wonderful conclusion that she had shown prospectively what LaShawn and Bonson had shown retrospectively, and that was indeed that there was a cancer-prone personality. And finally, the largest volume of work and the most recent comes out of Heidelberg, West Germany, that was started in Yugoslavia by Ronald Grossart Maticek, and he has reported multiple studies uh, with large populations in excess of a thousand people followed for long periods of time, all of which exceeding 10 years, some up to 20 years in length, showing the existence of cancer-prone personality. And the essence of the cancer-prone personality is a tendency to respond to stressful situations with a sense of hopelessness. That hopelessness was very adequately described, uh, that depression by Dr. Evans uh, in the chronic pain patient with with uh, depression with repression. It's a repressed <coughs> depression, so it's not an obvious depression, and this has led to some of the confusion in the field. The bottling up of emotions is the other very major factor. The cancer-prone person is described as too good to be true. They tend to be overly compliant in general. They're the nice people. And in medicine, that's what's always been said. The nice people die young, the mean ones, you can't kill them with a stick. <laughs> okay, in looking at coping strategies associated with length of survival, there are two authors that I think are very important to note. One is uh, Derek Goddess, also out of Johns Hopkins, who reported his findings and coping strategies as associated with increased survival in breast cancer and that was uh, reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association, 1979. The huge body of work that was, that was stimulated because of Derek Goddess's work is Greer's work, also looking at uh, coping strategies as associated with survival time in advanced breast cancer, and that's uh, reported, his 10-year study was reported in Lancet October 85, and his 15-year follow-up uh, was recently reported also in Lancet 
this year, January 9th. In the area of prevention of cancer with counseling, the work there is a single author, Isink and Matichek's work, and they've published theirs a number of times, but once was in uh, uh, the spring of 89, using minimal counseling, again taking cancer-prone personalities, uh, randomly dividing them and counseling one group, and dramatically impacting the incidence of cancer. I think some of the most exciting work that's come out of medicine and is being uh, routinely uh, ignored. Huge volume of work that Matichek has done. I had a chance to visit him in Heidelberg uh, last summer. And uh, uh, he's been involved in this work since 1966. I don't think anyone will ever equal the volume of work that, that he has generated and continues to generate in the field of psychosocial oncology. And number four, looking at increased survival as associated with counseling. Uh, I reported on this in the Journal of the Australian Medical Association in 1981. Uh, B.W. Fig Newton, who many of you know, uh, who also was a student of mine in this area, reported his results in 1982 in the American uh, Journal of Clinical Hypnosis and found actually uh, better survival times than, than I did in his patients. Ainsley Mears from Melbourne, Australia also uh, reported the impact of counseling and increasing survival times with people with advanced cancer. No one comes close to the volume of work again of uh, Ronald Matichek in this area and uh, he and I think have reported this in a number of places. Uh, the largest review article being in Psychology Today, December of 1989. And finally, finally the crowning study, uh, which was a study that was undertaken in an attempt to disprove my study in 1981 uh, by Stanford, uh, found almost exactly the same results that I did in counseling uh, breast cancer patients using a different model of counseling, but still the counseling of people with breast cancer when they found a doubling of survival times compared to a mass control population. This was a 10-year study um, and reported in Lancet, December of 1989. So looking at the literature, um, if we have any interest in this field, to me, uh, we cannot help but appreciate that this is a fertile field. And, um, so what do we do with this information? Well, number one, we don't uh, say, well, let's not uh, get patients' hopes up that counseling might impact survival or that this might be helping, but trying to do it in a balanced way, presenting people balanced information. That's, that's what I think uh, we owe to the people that we work with as responsible physicians. That to be overly conservative is as unhealthy for our patients as it is to be overly optimistic and attempting to be honest and balanced and to admit when, that we don't know and to be willing to walk that road with our patients is the essence of what this work is about. And I'd like to spend a few minutes looking at uh, basically what has been agreed upon as far as counseling models uh, and dealing with persons uh, with malignancy. And I had the opportunity of uh, sitting in a closed session in uh, Tutsing two months ago over south of uh, Munich. And for the first three days, the basic scientists uh, argued back and forth about the role of the immune system in cancer and, and uh, research design and psychoneuroimmunology. And uh, many of us um, sat there uh, using every hypnotic uh, technique we knew to keep ourselves from uh, needing to, to leave or develop illness in the room. And uh, finally, the last two days, we found basically that there was consensus, and that's very exciting, that there was consensus on what do you do with the person, which was very exciting because no consensus could be gained about what was being uh, observed from a basic science standpoint, and absolute consensus about what was the most effective 
uh, therapeutic approaches, and I'd like to summarize uh, what we agreed upon at that meeting. <clears throat> now, the important aspects of psychological intervention in cancer therapy have been elaborated by a number of authors. Uh, LaShawn is by far uh, the most published in the field. Bonson has written extensively. Matichek has written a number of good articles. Uh, I've written on this and many other people. In general, the therapy needs to be relatively gentle, and that's important. It needs to be gentle, acknowledging the vulnerability of the person with cancer. And LaShawn pointed out very accurately that it's important that the focus of therapy be, on, be with what's right with the cancer patient rather than what's wrong with them. I think this is a very important point to appreciate the importance of focusing on what's right with the person and helping them build on their strengths and then out of a place of strength begin to look at the pathology that has gotten them into the unhealthy place that they're in. It is so uh, much the traditional model because of the nature of counseling. You see, people come to counseling because they're unhappy in general. They're, un they're displeased with the way that they're feeling. So it's appropriate to begin to address those problems that are causing them to feel bad. Cancer patients don't come into the arena because they feel bad emotionally. So to begin to look at what's wrong with them mentally, emotionally, is absolutely contraindicated. Because now they perceive themselves not only as having cancer, but as being inadequate people from a personality, psychological standpoint. This is very important to appreciate. So much of the basic training in psychotherapy is counterproductive to dealing with a person with cancer. And that's because the person in psychotherapy comes for a very different reason then the person with cancer arrives. So you begin to help the person with cancer work on what they want to work on, and then when their pathology begins to get in the way of them going where they want to go, then you address those issues. Uh, and it's a very productive way of working. Uh, the other um, merely tends to take a person with cancer and help them become all the more depressed, and that depression becomes much more conscious then. And it is a great disservice. And we owe LaShawn a debt of gratitude for his astuteness in picking this up and showing that uh, contrary to the way he was trained and the way that people are trained in general in psychotherapy, that the approach to the cancer patient and probably in psychosomatic medicine in general needs to be the opposite direction. Oh, thank you. I need to speak more slowly. You see, I am in this dilemma. I want to get this all said. <laughs> what is that, a double bind? <laughs> I guess just long pauses don't make up for going too fast, though, do they? <laughs> okay. Based on the work of Greer, it's important that we support patients' existing coping strategies. This is very important. Traditionally, in psychotherapy, we tend to confront and attack denial. Denial is one of the most effective coping strategies for people with cancer. It's important that we support denial and help the patient develop healthier coping strategies and allow denial to be replaced as they develop a healthier coping strategy. If we confront the denial, the person tends to move into hopelessness. Hopelessness has less than half the survival characteristics as denial. So again, if we confront denial, whether overtly or covertly, then to me, we have the responsibility of staying with the patient until they develop a healthier coping strategy, which is a very, very difficult task. I did this out of ignorance for a number of years. I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I knew that it was not good for the patients, and now it's very clear that confrontation and denial 
um, is an unhealthy thing to do with cancer patients. It needs to be done only when the therapist has an understanding of what they're doing and what's going to be involved in helping the patient build a stronger coping strategy. It's important that the therapeutic process empowers the patient. This is work that was elaborated by Matichek. If the therapy interprets reality for the patient, the patient tends to do worse than if they received no counseling. That to me is very important because we as physicians, we as clinicians, tend to want to interpret things for patients. I noticed this, and patients want us to interpret their reality for them. And I, as a patient, want a therapist to interpret my reality because I don't want to do the work. I want the right answer. I don't want to have to stumble around for my own. But we best learn what we discover for ourselves, and that's true for all of us when we're healthy and when we're sick, when we're in the role of the physician and when we're in the role of the patient. And that's another important thing that we forget, is that we are all people. And it comes very home to us very strongly when we're diagnosed with diseases ourselves and find ourselves in the role of the patient. And we find that the healthcare providers tend to be the poorest of patients. And that is a lesson that we need to sit with and understand why that is. Any effective intervention is going to be educational in nature. It's important that people are taught the basics about relationships between beliefs, attitudes, and emotions. I believe the most effective way of teaching this, having tried a number of ways over the years, I personally believe the most effective way of teaching this is through some of the existing uh, cognitive behavioral therapies. I've been very excited to see the emphasis uh, on behavioral therapy at this Congress. I believe this is a major breakthrough uh, in counseling, and I think it is, as far as I'm concerned, the most effective way of helping people understand the interrelatedness between beliefs, attitudes, and emotions. There also needs to be a clear method of determining the, relatively health, the relative health value of beliefs. The best model I've found for this is one developed by uh, Maxi Malsby. And his book is uh, Rational Behavior Therapy. Using this approach, it has greatly simplified my work in helping patients understand the relative health value of their beliefs. Once a person has a clear method of determining the relative health value of their beliefs, then they're in a position to develop greater emotional mastery of their emotional lives. And as in learning anything, the use of the imagination is central. So the systematic use of imagery is important, whether we're teaching someone golf, or teaching them how to get well from cancer. Among the mandatory topics in a counseling program is systematically addressing the concepts of failure, guilt, and blame. Time's catching up with me, but I'm, I think I'm still going to win the race. Speaking slowly is not just something that I practice a whole lot. The biggest single criticism that's been leveled at psychosocial oncology is that it engenders guilt, blame, and failure in patients. I believe that it's important in implementing any form of psychosocial intervention to address issues of failure, guilt, and blame initially, because those are dealt with in the same way any other unhealthy emotion is dealt with. One central concept 
in helping to deal with failure, guilt, and blame is that we always do the best we can with the information that we have at the time. I don't have a problem in my patients with failure, guilt, and blame. It's one of the least of the problems. When it comes up, it tends to be very intense. But problems of anger in general and hopelessness are much, much greater. Where the problem occurs primarily are from people reading um, bits of information, piecing it together, and then in very unhealthy ways uh, using that information to help themselves uh, move into a very unhealthy place of feeling increased failure, guilt, and blame. But therapeutically, it's relatively easy to deal with. <laughs> Simple relaxation is one of the most important processes in psychosocial intervention. Many people, especially at the time of diagnosis, are in no place to do counseling and what has been found to be most effective is to teach them simple relaxation. This helps people move in to the space of neutral emotions, peace, tranquility. These are very healing emotional states. So I would say as Benson, Herbert Benson of Harvard has found and many others, one of the most healthy things that all of us can learn to do is to learn to relax and teach our patients to relax. Very, very important single part of psychosocial intervention. The roles of support and bonding are of obvious value. That's been dramatically uh, pointed out by Spiegel's study from Stanford. Helping people find meaning in the experience of having cancer is also very important and has been known for many, many years. And finally, in any intervention process, it's important to address spiritual as well as psychological issues. I was greatly pleased to find unanimous agreement in our working group in Tutsing that spiritual issues were critical to address. And that excites me very much because we've been very physically oriented in medicine since the time of Descartes. Only in the last 30 years have we really begun to look at psychological issues and we haven't begun to address spiritual issues. But in addressing spiritual issues, we need to find acceptable definitions of spiritual. Where I initially went was to Webster. And Webster defines spirit as the life force, especially in man and as the feeling and motivating part of man. The area in my own work where we most directly address spiritual issues is when we begin to work on concepts of death and the very important concept of inner wisdom or inner being. This to me very much directly relates to uh, many, many uh, physicians' observations, including Albert Schweitzer, who one of his most famous sayings is that within each person exists a wise physician. And from my standpoint, he wasn't talking about well-educated wasps in the United States. He was talking about the uneducated blacks of Africa. And he said, within each person exists a wise physician. And respecting this wisdom that resides within each of us and within each of our patients, to me this is part of the process that supports life and is the essence of spirituality as far as I'm concerned. To gain greater awareness of those things that go by the names of intuition and gut feelings have great value in living life and in regaining health. And finding ways of, uh, in ways of standardizing spiritual concepts and developing acceptable nomenclature are essential in order to research this area. A few weeks ago I had a chance to uh, be in another closed group where we were uh, looking at what we considered to be 
uh, the essential ingredients in healing. And again, we all agreed that one of the primary ingredients had to do with spirituality. And so much of the last of that meeting had to do with how do we develop research design for looking at spiritual issues. Well, there already exists a lot of research design looking at spiritual issues. One of the principal studies recently uh, was looking at uh, people who were randomly assigned uh, in a blind study into prayer groups. These were people who had had uh, heart attacks. And it was found that those people who were prayed for did very significantly better than those who were not prayed for. So very standard and certainly prayer would qualify as one of those things that we would tend to put in the category of spiritual. But we agreed that much of the research design that has been used to look at psychological issues can be used in looking at spiritual issues, sometimes with essentially no modification, frequently with minimal modification. And also some of the newer research design, such as those that go under the name of phenomenological research design, may well have great value. But to me, this is a, this to me is the frontier of psychosocial intervention, and that's the area of spirituality. Thank you very much. Dr. Giorgio Campanelli from Italy. Are you here? <laughs> 